Good morning. Welcome to Athena's Bible Study. I am Athena, and I'm coming to you from my home in Pegs, Oklahoma. And today we're going to be reading out of the book of Galatians. We got finished with the book of Daniel uh, yesterday, and now we're going to start the reading out of Galatians. Today's lesson is titled, The One True Gospel. Salvation is found only through faith in Jesus Christ. The text that my book says is most valid is, or golden text, oh, sorry my allergies are acting up today. As we said before, so say I, Paul, now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And that comes from Galatians 1 9, which we'll get to here in a few minutes. All right. The lesson today, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatian Christians, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, which is Galatians 4.19. Paul had brought the gospel to the Galatians, and now they were hearing a different gospel brought by false teachers who said they had to observe the ceremonies of the law of Moses to be saved. Paul was laboring to keep them from this evil. Alright, today, or first we're going to read Galatians 1, 1, 1 through 2, 5. And it is focused around beware of false gospels. Now before we get started, I do want to... Kick her off my stuff so that I can see. And please ignore my flyaways. Um, a little bit of back history on the Galatian church. A controversy surfaces in the church in Galatia that Ellie, you and I are going to go around, little girl. Some Jewish Christians insist that non-Jewish Christians need to follow Jewish law and ritual in order to be true members of the church. The book of Galatians offers Paul's defense of the true gospel by warning against mixing legalism and religion or religious rituals with God's gospel of grace. With a feisty, hard-hitting style, Paul reminds the believers to depend on Christ for salvation. He details the practical implications of living by grace and under the control of the Holy Spirit. Paul's letter to the Galatians explains what it means to be saved by faith alone. Paul defines what the gospel is, how it is received, and what applies to daily life. He is concerned about the temptation to please others. He reminds believers of their statue as co-heirs co with Christ through God's grace. Paul carefully outlines the work of the law and of grace of bondage and freedom using Hagar, Hagar, Hag, Hagar and Sarah as examples and he encourages believers to reflect God's character as they allow the fruit of the Holy Spirit to take root in their lives. What joy the book of Galatians brings as it makes it clear 
that we cannot be saved by keeping laws and rules, but we find salvation through faith in Christ alone, with the Holy Spirit working in us to instruct and guide us, we can live in faith, joyfully set free by the grace of God. All right. Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul. It was probably written sometime around 50 A.D. Several cities ha have been proposed, including Antioch, Euphesus and Macedonia. And it is where the fruit of the Spirit is lo located. 522 through 25. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there are no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the Spirit sinful nature with the with its passions and desires since we live by the spirit let us keep in step with the spirit all right so we're going to read galatians 1 1 and we're going to read all the way through to galatians 2 5 so this is going to be a lot of reading, and then I'll do some footnotes. Paul, an apostle sent not from men, nor by men. No, let's start over. Sorry. Paul, an apostle sent not from men, nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me to the churches of Galatia grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly desert, deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are lying to prevent you or to prevent the gospel of Christ but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that is preached to you let him be internally condemned as we have already said so now I say again if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted let him be eternally condemned. I or Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers... That the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. 
But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem and see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw, more, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assume you before God, or I assure you before God, that what I am writing you is no lie. Later, I went to Syria and Sicilia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith. He once tried to destroy and they praised God because of me. we going to to five all right 14 years later I went up again to Jerusalem this time with Barnabas I took Titus along also I went in response to the revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles but I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. Let's go ahead and read some. Information on what we just read. Alright. It says... It is hard to imagine Paul being more certain of the truth he preaches to the Galatians. He trusts in the truth of the gospel only as much as he trusts the one who gives it to him. Paul's revelation is indisputable, for it comes not from any human source. The writings or teachings of someone, but not from Jesus himself. Paul is so completely convinced that the truth that he warns the church of Galatia to reject any teaching that might appear contradictory, even if it comes from himself or an angel. How sure are you of the gospel? Questions and doubts are normal part of the journey of the faith. Yet it is God's desire that we believe completely in him what unspoken questions might be keeping your faith from deepening? Don't be afraid to take them to God. Go now and echo the prayer of the man who cried, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. All right. After greeting the Galatians, Paul turned his attention to the one true gospel. According to the plan of God the Father, Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. As a result, people can enter into a relationship with God that brings in this life and 
which begins in this life and extends beyond this life to eternity. Each person can be made right with God or justified by believing in Jesus Christ. In strong, decisive terms, Paul condemned anyone who dared to preach a message contradicting that he had already spoken to the Galatians. When he or he went on to say that even if an if he, an apostle of Christ, might turn away from the truth and promote a different gospel, he would desire deserve condemnation. Paul would not alter the gospel for human approval. Paul wanted the Galatians to know that his apostle Apostle, apostolic authority and calling to preach the gospel originated from God, not from the Apostle Peter or any other leader of the church in Jerusalem. Therefore, he had resisted some of the church at Jerusalem who wanted to require Gentile believers in Christ to submit to the ceremonial requirements of the law of Moses. As believers in Christ, church members and credentialed ministers must remain vigilant to identify those who distort the message which is the one true gospel. False doctrine cannot be ignored or neglected when it is beginning or when it is being encouraged within the church, it must be opposed with the truth and exposed for what it is. What is wrong with any preaching or teaching that says, in addition to, in addition to believing in and obeying Christ, you must do this or that to be saved from sin and have eternal life? Well... Pretty much it's because God said, or Jesus said, to believe in him and confess your sins. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to do uh, so many uh, sacrifices, that's the word I was thinking of, in order to get into heaven. Alright, we're going to go from 2.6 down to 2.14 now. Let me make a little quick mark here. Over there, don't go too far. Alright. As for those who seem to be important, whatever they were... Whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men add nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter, as an apostle to the Jews was also the work of my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. 
the other Jews joined him in his hypo hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel I said to Peter in front of them all you are a Jew yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow the Jewish customs all right at times Christians must be confronted because their words or actions contradict the message of salvation through Christ Paul mentioned that the Apostle Peter was acting in a hypocritical hypocritical way towards the Gentile believers in the church of Antioch in Syria while they're visiting the church so Paul rebuked Peter openly for his hypoc hypocritical behavior years earlier by means of a vision given to him by God discussed in Acts 10 9 through 20 Peter had learned the necessity of proclaiming the gospel to the Gentiles and of accepting those who would believe in Jesus Christ as fellow believers when Peter submitted to the mission misguided influence of the of some Jewish believers from Jerusalem he influenced other Jewish believers at Antioch including Barnabas to become conflicted in their in his hypocrisy this shows that misguided Christians can influence other Christians to stray from what is right regarding the essentials the doctrines and practices of Christians set forth in the New Testament we must be uncompromising regarding non-essentials things not commanded or forbidden it by scripture we should be non-judgmental in all things we should be motivated to guide by love for God love for Christ and love for others often adults think they are not influenced by peer pressure what warning should we take from the Apostle Peter's submission to peer pressure regarding the Gentile believers? Mm. Dry mouth this morning. Oh. <clears throat> oh, excuse me about that. I had to get me a drink there. All right. Now we're going to read 15 through 21. Two, Galatians 2, 15 through 21. Where did we leave off? 14? All right. <sighs> we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ so we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because of observe by observing by observing the law no one will be justified if while we seek to be justified in Christ it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I might, or I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me the life I live in the body 
I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for it, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. All right. Salvation by the law, God's commandments, would require perfect obedience to the law, and no one except Jesus Christ has perfectly obeyed the law. Therefore, it is not possible to be saved by obeying the law. Far from being saved by the law, we are, in fact, condemned by the law of sin as sinners, because it exposes our sinfulness and sin brings death. The passage in Galatians 2.20 is one of the best known and more, most often quoted verses in the New Testament because it describes second, secondly so, anyway the spiritual reality of living by faith in Christ as a result of being saved by grace, freed from the condemnation of the law by being crucified spiritually with Christ. We obtain a new life by faith in Christ, and the new reality is that Christ lives in us, making us Christ-like. Many Christians are moved by dramatic presentations depicting the death of Christ. Of these, how many see themselves, as the Apostle Paul did, as being crucified with Christ and raised to a new life with the resurrected Christ? If we have not already, it is good to see ourselves as crucified with Christ and raised to a new life with Him. This keeps us mindful that we are dead to the world and self-righteousness and alive with Christ. Why is it wrong to think that our salvation is gained in part by grace through faith and in part by our own good works that earn us merit for salvation? Alright. Life learning. Life related learning. This one is titled The Danger in Diluting the Gospel. In August 2001, a pharmacist was arrested and later pled guilty to diluting chemotherapy medications for numerous cancer patients. The 20 counts against him were for altering, misbranding, and tampering with drugs for the treatment of cancer, diabetes, and other diagnoses. What reason did this pharmacist give for diluting the medications which may have saved lives? At the least, the proper strength of these drugs would have offered relief from suffering or extended the lives of patients. The pharmacist said that he profited from diluting the drugs so that he could pay back taxes and fulfill his pledge of a million dollars to his church's building fund. Wow. The weakened drugs this pharmacist dispensed were for people with serious and deadly dis illnesses. The results were devastating to these critically ill people and their families. On December 5, 2002, the pharmacist was sentenced to 30 years in prison and ordered to pay $10.4 million in retribution to the families affected by this crime. This was a deserved and severe penalty for diluting much-needed medications. Most people would be angered by what the pharmacist did, but do we have the same intense desire that we and our families receive the diluted truth of the gospel? 
The dangers that come from diluting the gospel are spiritual, moral, social, and can be everlasting. Are we discerning about what we hear via the radio, television, internet, social media, videos, and movies? How can we recognize and reject dilutions of the gospel if we don't know the one true gospel found in the Bible? My mother was a woman devoted for knowing the word of God, the Bible. If she heard any doctrine being proclaimed that was new to her, she would test it by the Bible. She told her family about her asking God questions to which he would always eventually give her an answer from the Bible. Her confidence in the word of God became one of the foundation stones of my own faith as a Christian. What will the consequences be for ourselves and our families if we ingest a diluted gospel? Will we become spiritually weak and be deceived? Will we lose our souls? We must never be willing to take a chance on the diluted gospel. And that was written by Mrs. Phyllis Qualls Freeman. All right daily readings. Are we ready? Alright. We're going to, let me grab my phone here. Start out in Genesis. Genesis 3 and we're going to read 6 through 15. Genesis 3, 6 through 15 says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to her, the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaf fig leaves together to make themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. He said, And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, so I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What you do? What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and because and between you or between your seed and her seed he shall bruise you on your head and you shall bruise him on the heel all right reading the account in the bible of the sin of adam and eve is it is easy to be critical of them and to think, if I had been in the Garden of Eden, I would not have sinned. But in fact, we all have sinned, and the only way to freedom from sin is the great salvation promised by God through the Messiah's Savior, 
promised in Genesis 3.15, Jesus the Messiah came to save sinners. All right. Next reading is going to be Isaiah 53, 1 through 6. Isaiah 53, 1 through 6 says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look up upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him he was despised and forsaken of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scouring we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of Saul to fall on him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Okay, nope, that's the next one. Alright, so we ended at 6, to, uh, where it says, But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. This, patch of, this passage of scripture foretold the sufferings of Jesus, that the Messiah for our sins Christ died for our sins according to scripture. He had we or any others died for our sins, it would not have saved us from sin. Christ's death for our sin is effective for saving us from sin because he died the innocent and holy one for all who are guilty and unholy. All right, we're going to continue in Isaiah 53 and we're going to read 7 through 12. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom he the stroke was due he gave or his grave was assigned with wicked men yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence nor was there any deceit in his mouth but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. But his knowledge and the by his knowledge the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with 
great with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressions or transgression transgressioners transgressors there we go transgressors and was numbered with the transgressors yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors all right jesus died on the cross a sacrifice for our sins that reconciles us to god sacrifices of animals for sin during the old testament era pointed to the only sacrifice that could in fact atone for sins christ offering of himself on the cross is all sufficient sacrifice for our sins god made jesus a made jesus's soul an offering for sin to save us from the penalty of sin all right now we're going to go to the new testament and read romans 1 14 through 17 romans 1 14 through 17 it says i am under obligation both to greeks and to the barbarians both to the wise and the foolish so for my part i am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in rome for i am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of god for salvation to everyone who believes to the jew first and also to the greek for in it the righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith as it is written but the righteous man shall live by faith the apostle paul was not ashamed of the gospel because he as he said it is the power of god unto salvation to everyone who believes it the gospel of the good news that God sent his son to save us when it is believed has the spiritual power from God to make us his children we have every reason to be unashamed of the gospel all right next is 2 Corinthians 4 1 through 6 2 Corinthians 4 1 says therefore since we have this ministry as we received mercy we do not lose heart but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of god but by the manifestation of truth commended commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of god and if the gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the god of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory hang on Sorry, something popped up. All right. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image. Thank you, little girl. You just, your head just messed up my thing. All right. Where are we? All right. Second Corinthians 2, 4. Once again, it says, in the in whose case the god of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of christ who is the image of god for we do not preach ourselves but christ jesus as lord and ourselves as your bond servants for jesus sake 
For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts and to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It is God's will for the gospel to be made known to the people in language they can understand and without placing man-made complications in the way that leads to salvation. The Apostle Paul preached the gospel plainly, declaring, By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not yourselves, it is the gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8. Salvation comes by trust in Christ. And finally, we're going to read 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 10. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition or much opposition for our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel so we speak not as pleasing men but God who examines our hearts for we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though the apostles of Christ might have asserted our authority. But we proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother's tenderly cares for her own children having so fond an affection for you we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God but also our own lives because you have become very dear to us for you recall brethren our labor and hardship how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you we proclaimed to you the gospel of God you are witnesses and so is God how devoutly and uprightingly and blamelessly we behaved toward, your, toward you believers All right. The gospel must be proclaimed and taught as it is set forth in the New Testament without adding to it or taking from it. Like the Apostle Paul, we must strive to please God in our presentation of the gospel. To please God in our presentation of the gospel, we must be true to the Lord Jesus and his word not only with our words, but also with our living. Alright. So, that is what I have for you today. Let's take a peek over here tomorrow. It's going to be titled, Live by Faith. Christians are called to live by faith in Christ. And that is what we're going to talk about tomorrow. So, I do hope you're enjoying this new the new segment that we're started the uh, the uh, gospel in the Galatians. There's a lot to learn, and 
until tomorrow I'm going to bid you goodbye my name is Athena this is Athena's Bible study I'm coming to you from Pegs Oklahoma and I hope to see everybody again tomorrow have a blessed day